That ugly cat is his name Hunter? Baby, let me ask you something. Is you down? Oh, here's Leno. Shot scores. They go into the goal. Leno goes in the middle of the shot. Block the shot. Scores. Matthew Kachuk. What a goal. Back to Matthews. In front. Oh, what a stop by Markstrom. How does that not go? And play continues. Monahan back across. Monchiapani scores on the backhand. What a play as he worked it off his foot. Amor Lucic plays it over. Lucic scores. Comes Monahan. Monahan. Right in. Scores. Sean Monahan in overtime. Like Shillington. Right in. Scores. Oliver Shillington. Here comes Coleman. With a punch of rain. Scores. Moment. Here's Dubé, and Dubé cuts him from the backhand, score! Backlund, shoots, score! Line kept on side by Hannafin, who races into the play. He's in deep, up front, scores! Noah Hannafin! Oh my goodness! And somehow that stayed out too! They're on their feet in Calgary! Left corner for Aginla, Aginla to the left circle, Aginla shot, shows the save, rebounds! He scores! Oh. Yeah, baby! <laughs> all right, Raja, well, I'm a little hungover this morning, but that's all right. Here. Might have celebrated the Flames win last night a little too hard, but I am excited to talk some Flames hockey. The whole week, dude. The whole week was sick. I don't even. I don't even want to take into account what happened on Thursday in St. Louis. Like to me, that was like obviously fatigue's a factor mixed in with what Kachuk said. Like team needs to learn not to get too high, not too low. They need to stay middle grounded. Let's start with the St. Louis game. Because holy shit, that was like it felt like the eighteen nineteen flames watching that game. It, Seriously, it it did. And I, I was so happy my buddy bought tickets to that game. I was sitting in the fourth oh. row, and oh my god, was I just having a blast! And I even texted you that day. I was like, when you told me you were going, I was like, yeah, no, I have a good feeling about tonight. Like I straight up told you that. You did. I, I didn't believe you. I was like, oh, I really hope you're right. And it blew me away. Like. Bro, Kachuk and Goudreau combined for nine points that night. I know. They were absolutely buzzing all night. Every time either one of them had the puck in the offensive zone, you just knew they were going to generate something. It was ridiculous. When Justin Falk came out and was like, yeah, I, I, I don't want, I'm not excited to be playing Canada. And then the Flames media team was like, we see why the Blues wanted to get out of Canada. <laughs> oh, God. That was a great meme. Oh. And can we talk about Nikita Zadorov and Eric God Branson that night? Their wins above replacement level that night was an 86. You can't make it up. Like, add that to the fact that Zadorov had a multi-point game. Like, he's had that snipe. And that then sp- this. was disgusting. Like, meeting of the post and the crossbar. Freaking beautiful shot. And every time somebody tried to break through on his wing, nope, 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 nope. Nope. Puck turned back up ice. Another goal, another goal, another goal. It was unbelievable. I know that fan base is still on him with due to his, you know, AAV and what, you know, he was kind of marketed to be when we acquired him. But I don't know how us and in the dome became like the number one, like source for the Zadorov fan club. (laughs) Because like I like I'm looking at this, I'm like the number of people that are bashing this guy, even though you look at like the metrics and all this, like, yeah, you could say analytics don't mean anything, but like I mean they play a part. It gives you a decent indication. We're not sitting here being like, oh, Josh Levo was better than Matthew Kachuk because the wins above replacement are high. It's like, no, <laughs> we're not that sim- simple-minded here. I'm just saying, like, you take a look at the amount of stones that are being thrown at Zadorov, and it's like he's not he is not deserving of them he's actually fit into Daryl Sutter's system pretty nicely like especially this last week I've had nothing but like 
good things to say about him. Seriously. Even in that uh, in that loss to St. Louis, I still thought Gabranton and Zadorov were pretty solid back there. They they were solid against St. Louis. They were solid in Columbus. I mean, they they struggled, I think, a little bit analytically in St. Louis. Yeah. But um, I guess it's overarching. Like, I'm not going to sit and complain. Like No, that. and there's always games where players are going to have an off night, right? Like, nobody had a good night in St. Louis oh, on Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, you can't throw that on that their defensive pairing and I mean I still think they were one of our better defensive pairings that night I think they might have outplayed Hannafin and Anderson even the analytics favor Hannafin and Anderson a little bit more but it's not as drastic you take a look at the like Monday night you know that game was absolutely ridiculous like I am still in shock that like the deserve to win meter wasn't higher we had an 85.4 against St. Louis like you take a look at individual players' expected goals metrics. Brett Ritchie was the only Calgary Flame to still manage to score a wins above replacement level below 50%. <laughs> and he was still above everybody on the St. Louis Blues. <laughs> yeah, he was, like, in line with David Perron. Like, that's yeah. like, like what? Blues. Yeah. Man, that, like, I don't – Manj, Backlund, and Coleman had a really good game on Monday. They drove quite a bit, even though the points, like – didn't really dude Manji like I need I, I kind of wish Manji hopped in on the scoring like in that 7-1 thumping like I kind of kind of felt bad that he had like a few looks and like none of them were going in for him well he had that one back backdoor pass that was wide open for a tap in and whoso comes flying across robs him he gets the puck back on his backhand and rings it off the post of the wide open net I was like no you could tell he was so disappointed Gaudreau and Kachuk as a duo they're the second best duo in the NHL now behind McDavid and Dreisaitl they're the best two-way line like it's it's undisputed, and we pl- and they played almost a hundred more minutes than the next top line in the NHL. What we found with Gaudreau, Lindholm, and Kachuk is absolutely amazing. The hard checking and defensive play that Lindholm and Kachuk bring to the table opens up Gaudreau's offensive ability and playmaking so much, and that line has just found it this year. It's like not to mention that like Kachuk in his own right, is an app. He has disgusting hockey sense. You, you look at the number of one touch passes that Johnny and Matthew feed to each other, whether it's like behind the back or just like chipping it up. It's like Kachuk with five assists on that game on Monday night, five assists on that Rizichka goal. Johnny quick over to Chucky, one touch back into the middle. Rizaka wide open, bury that. It's just disgusting. They see the ice so beautifully. I was so happy that Ruzicka hopped in with that goal there. My God, that was so sick. I, that was such a sexy goal too, like the tic tac toe. It was beautiful. Oh, like, like there's an account on Instagram, uh, Puck Takes. They're talking about just how dominant, like, you know, the Gaudreau Kachuk Lindholm line is. They're the best two way line in hockey, and like you take a look at their minutes. Like they, like you said, like they've played pro- almost 130 minutes more than the next best or not I mean the next line that's played a good amount and that's the Ovechkin Kuznetsov Wilson line in Washington and they still don in night in night out like it all starts in the defensive end too like they adopted you know Daryl's if you want to call it defensive system I like to call it checking system they like the amount of chances that they've been able to create off the rush has just been ridiculous with it. Like they just kind of took what he was serving up and said, let's go. Like, And I just want to go back to Eric Francis saying that Johnny Gaudreau will never excel under Daryl Sutter system and just freaking watch a game, Eric, watch a game. Did you hear how he has his own like segment now on 960 every Friday? Francis Fridays like bro I'm trying to enjoy my Friday what a joke so I decided to tune into flame stock which is like the new podcast that they're pat and you know pinder and those guys are uploading now yeah and I was listening to the Francis segment on you know Francis Fridays and <laughs> he was talking about how you know I'm gonna I'm gonna play the clip because I think it's an absolute joke yeah play it I'm gonna I'm gonna play it 
money, whatever the case may be, a combination of the two, a chance to try a new city closer to home, whatever the case may be, here's where it's going to sting more or less. If he has a good playoff, it's going to sting like hell. And it's going to be one of the biggest losses in the history of this franchise. No question about it. Especially because you're going to get zero back for him. However, if he has a poor playoff, I think that cushions the blow tremendously because a lot of people have pointed out, like me, that come playoffs, he becomes more and more irrelevant. Um, I don't oh know my. He's playing this year. I'm more optimistic that he's going to be a significant contributor yeah, in the playoffs. Like, like a, he's really, I can't say enough about Johnny Gaudreau. I know there are a lot of people who think that I'm always down on Gaudreau. You've heard me all this season long raving about this guy. I have nothing bad to say about him. New world in the playoffs. And, and again, I'm not saying he's going to be bad. I'm just going to say that that is going to be the biggest determinant as to whether or not his loss in the offseason is going to be, you know, monumental or maybe not quite as bad as everybody's bracing for. Uh, he, he lost me after he said the that it wouldn't be as monumental. He just talks out of his ass to save his job and freaking do whatever he can. Hey, he was talking about how he thinks also Kachuk's going to walk too, eh? He started to hop on that train too. Yep. He, he, those are his favorite trains. Who, okay, if we lose Kachuk or Goudreau, who do we bring back in to fill that massive void? Pat Steinberg. I really want to meet this guy. Seriously. He's, right? so, he's literally as optimistic as I am. Like, it's actually ridiculous how, like... I don't know. He just has a lot of good vibe to him that when he's yep. on a segment with Eric Francis, it's like you've got the angel and the devil talking to each <laughs> other on the shoulder. Like, <laughs> like what? It's so weird, man. Like it is, it is. It's just ridiculous. And like, so now that we're still raving about Johnny and Chucky, check this out. The only other line in the NHL this season with 300 plus minutes played and better stats is the Maroon, Belmar, and Perry line over in Tampa. But even then, they still have 164 less minutes played and don't make as large of an impact offensively. The best two-way line in hockey, man. And we've allowed eight goals, dude, when they're on the ice. That's it. Oh, my God. Like, they're the best two-way line in the NHL. I don't care. I Like, you can come in and be like, oh, yeah, 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 you're biased and whatnot. Like, no. no. Yeah, but first line's better. They're better two-way. Marchand and Bergeron. No, get out of here. I don't care. I will argue this till the day I die. I will argue with anybody that the Flames have the best two-way line in hockey. It's funny because even Eric Francis was like, uh, I don't know if you can make the argument that they're the best line in hockey if you're talking to someone at a bar from another market. It's like, hey, buddy, just like I get that you I, – I, I get what – you're kind of implying, but I don't appreciate your pessimism. Anyway, so then the Columbus game. Yep. yep. On Monday, and safe to say a double homicide occurred back to back. Domination from start to finish. Um, like that game was even more dominant than the St. Louis game metrically. Deserved to win a meter was what, 96%? Yeah, 95.2 to 4.8. Like, get dumped on. <laughs> like, Act- man, like, you take a look. Zadorov and Goodbranson were also in the 85 expected goals range. Shillington and Tanev were at 95 that game. Adam Ruzicka had the best expected goals percentage in Columbus. Did he? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm really glad that, and we'll get to that in a bit, but I'm really glad that, like, Daryl's trusting him. Kind of witnessed history on Wednesday, Noah. We kind of kind of watched our team uh, break the uh, franchise record for most shots in a game. Pat's tweet was, Calgary finishes with 62 shots, and there's 6 nothing win over Columbus. Win is too nice. Just say thumping. Like, just, we, we get it. Murder, thumping. Yeah, like, domination, <laughs> like. Come on, use some describing words here, Pat. I like this. This was like some sort of like Thor landing in Wakanda type shit. That was like, <laughs> like this was some Avengers type, like uh, brand new franchise record. They're just a the 15th NHL team to record 62 or more shots in a game dating back to 1960. In 1960, wow. for the record, in 1960, Noah and I were minus 40 years old. So that's, 
<laughs> that's really cool. You don't see that in today's NHL anymore. The, the game isn't like that anymore. Yeah. That's I mean, absolutely unheard of. Oh, man. Like, you take a look at everything. Like, shots are 62 to 23, right? 75 shot attempts as opposed to 38. Wow. 30, scoring chances were 34 to 13. <laughs> High dangers, 15 to 3. I felt so bad for the fans that paid money to go watch that game, dude. Oh, my God. I, I was, can't believe <laughs> sitting in their seats at the end of that game. Man, like, seriously, like, I looked and I was like, I, I feel so bad for you right now. Like, if you're, if you're a fan of the Columbus Blue Jackets in Columbus, God bless you, seriously. Like, you are as true diehard. You like, you love the game. You went, you paid money to go watch this, <laughs> and we absolutely obliterated you. Like, on behalf of us and the rest of the fan base, I'm so sorry. Oh, <laughs> like, there's just... You did not know it was going to be a good night when you watch Backlund come in and just rip a clap bomb and beat Merzlikens. So, okay, so Backlund scores. <clears throat> and I, I got to admit, I, I, I missed it initially. I was getting a drink of water from my kitchen. And I just hear scores. And I was like, I asked my dad, I'm like, who scored? He's like, Backlund. I was like, come again. <laughs> wait, what? Are you serious? I was like, wait, really? Like, don't don't play with me. Don't you tell me he ended that 18 game drought? Like, <laughs> like my God, dude. Like, I first of all, I'm happy that Backlund scored. I we just need him to produce. Like when you're making that much, even Daryl like called him out, right? It was like when you when you've got the veteran guys that are making the money that they're making, you expect point contributions out of them. And like second. Yeah, you need to you need to be scoring goals. Like, I I, I I'm glad that. Yeah, I'm just glad you did because seriously, like, <laughs> get that monkey off your back. Yeah, like it's it's it, something else, dude. I I don't know. I feel like the St. Louis game, especially earlier in the week, kind of set the tone for what this team can do. And I mean, the Blues. Not to give a slight to the Jackets, but obviously the Blues are the way are the better team, right? Oh so yeah, for Definitely. us to be in order for us to be doing that to a team as dominant as St. Louis has been this season was like, holy shit. Like we really came to play. Like, this is what this team can do, I guess, in this scenario. Like Johnny Goudreau had eight shot attempts on Monday, that St. Louis game shots were 48 to 21 power play went two for five. We actually scored a bit on the power play surprisingly uh, shot attempts were 71 to 22 Scoring chances, 39 to 10. High dangers, 18 to 4. So if you look at the common theme on the Monday and Wednesday games, like it was literally a double homicide, as stated by the wonderful people over at In the Dome. They're hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, I love those guys over there. Like, man, we should ask them to, like, they would want to do a collab with us. That'd be sick. That would be sick. I hope we don't even have to ask. What if, they, what if they're hearing this and they just say, sure, why not? That'd be dope. Too. Could, that would, hey. <laughs> I know, right? Then... Thursday night happened. It's the third game in four nights, right? I don't expect them to be – I didn't think that we were going to dominate. No one, I think, who was level-headed would have thought that we were going to dominate them again in that fashion. No. Like, and you knew St. Louis was going to be pissed off coming in that game. They wanted that win so bad. Like, when I, even when I was at the, the Monday night game in Calgary, um, like, it wasn't the fact that St. Louis didn't care. Like – Every time guys were coming back from shifts, they were snapping sticks on the bench, slamming the boards, kicking the bottom of the boards, like screaming at each other. Like you knew they were going to be ready to go on Thursday night when we went into St. Louis. Why is Jacob Markstrom getting that start on Thursday? That's something that like I, everybody knows me. I am the biggest Jacob Markstrom fan around. That guy is an absolute beauty and I love him, but like, come on, we got to get Vladar some games in there. I can't, we're going to lose marks from the injury again. If we keep riding them like this, I found Daryl's reasoning for why he started him to be kind of just, I guess, weird. Like he was saying, Oh yeah, he hasn't faced, he hasn't had much work when he's in there. Like to be fair, like shot totals have been lower, but at the same time, like Daryl, you look at the schedule that's coming up in February, like you have a game starting like after the all-star break, you're playing a game every second night until the end of April. It is like, it's an absolutely disgusting schedule after the all-star break. And it's like, I get the fact that he's not facing many shots and maybe he is feeling good, but at the same time, like, 
objectively, don't you want your backup? Like, Vladar is going to have to play a big role in this second half, dude. He's going to have to play games. So don't you want to get him in there and let him get comfortable in the net? Because when was the last time Vladar played? Like Last time he played was the Tampa, Carolina, Florida road trip. He, he played that back-to-back, and then we haven't seen him since. Right. Yeah. Like, And I love Vladar, dude. Like, he, he's a beauty. This team has combined for nine, nine shutouts this season. Two of them are his. Like you, you should have enough faith. And I don't, I don't think it has to do with faith. I think it's for whatever reason, like historically, even when Kipper was here and stuff like Daryl always, like there was one season where Kipper literally started 73 games, dude. Yep. 82. Like that's well, like. Daryl's teams in LA and how much quick played when Daryl was head coach there. He loves his number ones. He loves them. And I mean, I, I get that to an extent, but at the same time, like, I also want, like, knowing that Markstrom has a history, we saw it firsthand last year, we saw it in Vancouver even prior to him signing here. It's the number one concern with him as a goaltender. The guy leads the league in shutouts this season, right? Dead. We Dead. know how good he can be and how just, I guess, opportune he can be at the right time to make that big save when we need it but it's like you can't you're not going to get those saves if you keep overplaying him did he not look out of whack on thursday like there was a couple the first two goals that st louis scored those are ones that i think he's got to have like the, the way i see it with the st louis game like it was a good five on five game for us i guess for the most part it was a good game five on five like even ryan pike basically explained it the best they weren't bad. They weren't quite good enough. But like you take a look at five on five metrics in St. Louis. Like this is why I'm like, eh, like with the week that we've had six out of eight points, like I, I don't really take that Thursday night game into much stock. We outchanced them like high dangers were 10 to four. But again, your power play sucked ass, right? Your bottom six was brutal in St. Louis. Gizadorov and Goodbranson struggled that game. Although, you know, I mean, the whole team struggled markstrom i guess did the best he could but like you take a look at that game in st louis is that not the prime example of our forward depth needs to be addressed or else we're going to lose games because that was the one game where our top line was held off the score sheet so you hold gaudreau and kachuk off the score sheet you're not getting scoring anywhere else. And you're playing a team in St. Louis Blues. You could see them in the playoffs, right? Oh, yeah. Like, address address this scoring thing, please. And with the start of, I guess, these rumors, hey, like, we're connected now to JT Miller, Connor Garland, both Canucks. Yeah, both Canucks. Like, do something. Add one of them. Seriously, this is so... Can you imagine if this, if this, if the, we found a way to acquire JT Miller? And like the asking price isn't even that bad for JT. They want uh, a prospect yeah. and a first round pick. Yeah. Are you willing to pay that for JT Miller? Cause I am. I, I'm willing to pay for anyone who can put the puck in the net. <laughs> I'm willing, I'm willing to pay for pretty much just about any goal scorer right about now, right about now. Yeah, pretty pretty much. Friedman was mentioning that, you know, JT Miller, the Flames have interest. I'm like, please don't come. Like, I, if you're going to report on it, actually do it. Because I'm sick and tired of hearing, oh, we're in on this guy, and then nothing. It's getting really, really fucking old hearing that the Flames are interested in this guy and that guy and this guy. Don't tell me about it. How about you tell me when he's in a Flames jersey, okay? Like, that was the thing. Like, last night, even on Hockey Night in Canada, Elliot Friedman in the intermission was talking about how he feels that the Flames are going to add. They feel pressure to go for it because of the uncertainty that's coming up this offseason. And I'm like, Elliot, buddy, if, like, I, I, I love you. I love your podcast. Say hi to Jeff Merrick for me. But at the same time, you take a look at the common theme every year in Calgary. What did I go say? Out, like, yeah, like you're going to go out and tweet that. We're going to sit there and be like, huh, okay. So what you're saying is our donut GM actually has a need that he's focused in on, but no, let's 
we're not going to do that because he's playing Friedman that he does the same as the year before then and the year before that how many guys after this deadline are going to be added to the whole uh always in never close mantra we should make like a montage after the trade deadline of just like sad music and all the players that the were interested in and just like a slideshow it's getting to the point now where it's like you're looking at how the top line is playing not only are you afraid about what they're going to be worth this summer with you know trying to convince them to hey please stick around here please please for the long time please please what what can you do to get Gadron Kachuk on the same board to stay here long term? Make a fucking move that shows that you at least give a shit about going far in the playoffs. Seriously. Exactly. Man, Matthew Kachuk and Johnny Gaudreau, like when when I say that they've been carrying this team, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that they are literally the reason why we win games. The only reason, other than Markstrom. The Flames have scored 29 goals and have, had, and have given up only eight with the top line on the ice. The team has been outscored 33 to 46 with the unit off the ice. Johnny Goudreau leads the league with 17 primary five-on-five five assists and is fourth in five-on-five five scoring overall. And Matthew Kachuk ranks seventh in even strength scoring and has been one of the strongest play drivers in the league. He's got a 62.81 expected goals for rank. And that's only just behind Patrice Bergeron and Brad Marchand. Matthews is in that category too, in terms of forwards with, you know, total of more than 300 minutes played. And like Johnny is as fruitfully dynamic as ever. And Kachuk just turned into one of the most complete players in the league. And it's a joke that he's not at the all-star game. Seriously. It is. The fact that Troy, Troy Terry's there is a joke. Like, uh, and now with Batherson being hurt, which was so fucking stupid watching that Aaron Dell play. Well, yeah, what was that? Like, now that Drake Batherson is hurt, Brady Kachuk is now going to, to Vegas. So I'm like, man, Brady is going to Vegas and Matthew is it? That makes it 10 times worse. Especially when Matthew, I mean, I love Brady with all my heart because I genuinely love the Kachucks, especially when Matthew deserves it more. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> um, now knowing that Nathan McKinnon can't go either because of that Taylor Hall incident. You know what? Like, is the All-Star game even like who like I'm in the camp of who cares? It's a joke. Like it, I, I genuinely, I, I don't, I couldn't care less. And that sucks because I mean, I'm going to watch it and I enjoy watching it all every year, but um, until they fix the format, it's always going to be seen as a joke, right? They fix the format. The, this, it's not a participation game. It's an all-star game. Not one player from each team doesn't have to go. This isn't freaking preschool. Like <laughs> best players go to the all-star game. That's how it works. That's how it's supposed to be. That's what it's like in the NBA. You go, you watch the NBA, you're watching the guys that make money for the league. There's nobody from the Detroit Pistons going to the fucking all-star game. Like, <laughs> what a joke, man. Jeez. I, yeah, that, that got underneath my skin a little bit, this all-star game. And, like, Markey not making it over Demko and Gibson, I'm sorry, but, like, the dude's got seven shutouts on the year now. Now that we're on that train, let's talk about the Vancouver game last night. Tyler Myers is a piece of shit. <laughs> because, like, okay, long neck, what the fuck are you doing going and elbowing the guy from the back of the head? What did Trevor, like, Trevor Lewis, right, like, like, love tapped this dude's face, and he comes in, turns into General Zod, like, I will find him, and just comes <laughs> in, just, I was like, that is one of the worst headshots I've seen in the last three, four years. Yeah, honestly, it was brutal. It, it was just a complete targeted headshot. And like everyone was saying like, oh, Brad Richardson did the same thing in Tampa and uh, didn't get suspended for it. It's like Richardson wasn't as targeted though. Like you make the argument that like that one didn't deserve as like the, the heat that was around it. This one, first of all, Tyler- has a history. He saw red and he took Trevor Lewis's head off. 
I was in shock that Trevor Lewis came back to the game to start second. I was like, you're on the bench? Like, you're alive? <laughs> like, I was like, like did you see his reaction when they confirmed the five-minute major for, for Myers? He was pissed about it. I was like, what, what is going on? Like, it's like, listen up, cherry face. I need to talk to you for a second. Like, dude, like, I, I... And Myers is like, oh, well, Brett Ritchie attacked me. He attacked me. Like, shut up, Tyler. Like, you are such a bitch. <laughs> I'm like, oh. it's funny. Like, you look at guys like Tyler Myers and, like, even guys like Jacob Truba, like, guys that are just big and, like, they're kind of wussy. Like, you're big, but, and you do shit that's, like crossing a line but then when you someone retaliates you fold yeah tyler myers is like what six foot seven or six foot five something like that and you're gonna curl up like a baby and cry about it when somebody comes after you this is actually really funny tyler myers gets his fucking giraffe face touched and proceeds to throw (laughs) a temper tantrum and hit trevor lewis in the head That's literally what happened. Like, that is literally an accurate depiction. I saw that hit, and I immediately, like, I was like, I screamed. I have not been that irate in terms of whenever, like, anything physical happens, I I lose it. Like, I sit and I start swearing. I start losing my damn mind. That hit was so stupid, dude. Like, you look at guys like Truba and, like, Tyler Myers – they're big boys who fold when they're in altercation. Like, remember when Sam Bennett bloodied Jacob Druba like six years ago now? Yeah. Like, seriously, like there, it doesn't matter how big you are. Like, no. It's it and was absolutely look, pathetic. You look like you look at a guy like Manjapani, where like he gets into stuff. You don't see him curl or back down or turtle. He. He's always in the mix. He's always going to be in there in the scrum, throwing throwing around punches, giving the guys a face wash, everything. Yeah, like I <laughs> – crazy. I, I saw that hit, and, like, my immediate reaction was – like, I was irate. Like, I literally got up from my chair, started yelling at the TV, started yeah. saying some unspeakable things that I will not disclose here. And I looked over and my dad was like, what's going on? I'm like, well, Trevor Lewis just got fucking murdered. <laughs> and to that, my dad said, who? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, the disrespect here is so hard, but I am, a, I am irate. Okay. <laughs> Leave me alone. Like, fuck dude. I did not want to see that. That was terrible. That was cheap. That was dirty. It's probably not even going to get looked at now either. Like I no. haven't seen any news about, a potential hearing or whatnot for Tyler. But, no, I haven't either. And like but, even the Hockey Night in Canada, like Hockey Central panel was talking about how the hit wasn't vi- like vicious. I'm like, guys, he literally saw him, made eye contact with him, and then retaliated because Buddy got all a little love tap on the nose. Like, like what? Were people watching the same hockey game as us last night or – Dude, the number of Canucks fans that DM'd our page being like, the hit was clean. I'm like, I, how about you get smacked by a 6'7 behemoth to the back of your neck and we'll see how if you're slurring your words. Like, yeah, if you still think it was clean. Yeah. Like, my God. Like, it, it's so, I, like, I did not appreciate the hit. That was one of the worst headshots I've seen in years. And no one yeah. can tell me otherwise. I, no. I mean, very firm on that um trevor is way too old to be taking headshots like that that's what i'm saying that's what i felt so bad i was watching this i was like no no (laughs) not trevor like (laughs) like not anyone i don't want to see anyone get hit like that but especially not someone on my team but like bro i thought to be going into retirement after that hit last night (laughs) like a ryan lomberg like remember when bill peters sent Ryan Lomberg onto the ice solely to jump somebody and then leave. Like he took yep. the suspension and then cut. Yep. Oh my God. Like that's literally what I wanted. I was like, I don't care who's here. I like Brett Ritchie landed a solid punch or two, but like, well, it was one punch. Let's be real here. But yeah, like, man, like that big was... Ernan or what? Like, can we throw a flames Jersey on big Ern and send them out there? 
it's like yo i know that you're like working in like what was his position like something about like player like mental health relations or something like that yeah yeah like a player resources guy or something like that it's like yo i know that you're probably in the building right now uh we need a we need a little jackass who's wearing number 57 that you got to take care of right now (laughs) god dude like i i don't know how that was absolutely pathetic vancouver game last night that was oh four daryl sutter hockey dude to a T, like to a T, like for the record, during the 04 run, Noah and I were three years old, so we can't tell you based off of experience, um, watching the games live what the 04 run was like. But there's such thing called game tape. Um, we have I, I have watched every game of the 04 run multiple, multiple times. Yep, um, I know exactly the style of hockey that was being deployed last night was that to a T. To a T. I it, saw so many like Instagram comments and stuff after the game where it's just like snooze fest, so boring, fell asleep, who cares, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I was I was at the bar last night watching the game, and all my buddies, like they were they weren't interested in the game at all. They were all having their side discussions and whatnot. And I was sitting there, I was glued to the TV, man. I was I I wasn't partaking in any conversation. I was glued to the TV. I was loving the game, and you know Daryl is so happy behind that bench, just watching that game. Like that is that's his old stomping grounds. He sees that and he loves it. Like that style of game in particular makes me more stressed than any sort of comeback attempt. Let's get into it. Like so, you know, shots were thirty-two to fifteen. In favor of the Flames, you know, even on the five-minute major, we didn't score any. Like, dude, our power play. What is going on there? I, I and I texted you. I texted you last night. I was like, this power play is just terrible, just terrible. There was a couple chances that Lindholm had. Lindholm had some pretty high danger oh. shots. Oh, just robbed him on, and you could tell Lindholm was just pissed about it. His shot attempts were fifty-two to twenty-nine, right? Scoring yeah. chances twenty to sixteen. Vancouver actually had one more high danger than we did, but also very minimal. They were three to four. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Like, this game was like, if this game happened any other year prior to Daryl Sutter being behind the bench, we would have lost this game in regulation. We don't, we don't force this game to overtime. Like with the way that Goudreau ended it, like just at the very start of OT, like how, how is Johnny Goudreau not in the heart conversation right now? Seriously. Honestly, like, like it is. What a clap bomb too. Like oh. I love <laughs> to see him wind it up. I love it when he's when he's hype after a goal and he just goes and like goes to the fans, either like slams the boards or like jumps along the boards. Yeah. There was that game in 1819 where we won against Philly and he did like the whole like Yeah, get down down, all- down the <laughs> ring. Oh my god. Like, yeah, I, I, I need that. that. Yeah, I love that. I love that. God bless you, Johnny Goudreau. I love you so much. Like you don't understand. Like I, like oh, man, like I can't picture this team without Johnny or Matthew. And like I, whatever the hell you have to do to get these guys locked up long term, like just do it. Imagine this team right now without the top line. I can't. Seriously. Dude, we would be literally a freaking KHL roster. <laughs> we would be we would be praying for Shane Wright come July, dude. Like we worse than the Montreal Canadiens by a landslide. Uh, if Sam Bennett was on this team right now, he'd be leading the team in goals. I'm so happy for the guy though. Like you, you knew you knew he could never put it together here, mm-hmm. and I'm so happy found success in Florida. Dude, I, I he's always gonna be a fan favorite of mine, like in my household. Like it's no, I think that's for every Flames fan. I mean, he's the highest draft pick the Flames have ever had. God, I hate that we have to say that. Um bring someone in who can score. The last guy Brad brought in, I think, at the deadline was like Nick Shore. Remember like 17, 18? His deadline consisted of acquiring Nick Shore. And then claiming Chris Stewart, who's now retired off of waivers. Like that was the last time I think he added some a forward at the deadline. Am I wrong? Oh, I mean, I don't because that was the 2018 deadline, right? The year before he added Lazar, right? So the year before it was Lazar, 2018 was 
the Nick Shore Chris Stewart show. And oh, then 2019 was Fantenberg, and then we got into the depth defenseman BS, right? So yeah. Oh my god, that, that was the last time he added a forward at the deadline, dude. Like, just make a fucking real move, Brad. The la- <laughs> please, like we're, we're not asking for Put much. Put on your big boy pants and make a fucking move to make this team better. Like, man, like this week was the most telling thing on the planet. This team is good when they're on. We sat and harped about depth for like the last, what, three, four episodes, right? Since we started this podcast, we've only had three, four episodes. Um, And then the St. Louis game, everyone's scoring. And it's like, okay, Columbus, you're getting, you. we combined for 13 goals in two games, right? And then we scored two in our last two. Like, dude, add another. Like, I texted you yesterday. I was like, we should just drive down to the dome and kidnap JT Miller. <laughs> like, hold it, yeah, hold him hostage. Like, Brad isn't going to do it. He's not going <laughs> to do it. It's up to us. Yeah, okay, we might be engaging in some criminal activity, right? But it's, <laughs> it's you know how it's like in Ant-Man when he's, like, trying to get a job at Baskin-Robbins? They're like... Yeah. They're like, oh, but I, I only burgled them. Like, I didn't rob them. Oh, yeah, it's a cool crime. See, without well, a crime with a good intention, right? Like, that's, that's, that's what it is. Like, like we're, our hearts are in the right place with this. Like, JT, like, bro, I know. Like, whatever you need, really. Like, I'll book you a spot in the Fairmont, like the Palliser. They make a mean Caesar salad. I will <laughs> give you whatever you, like, whatever you need. Whatever you need. Like, I am broke, but I will help a millionaire stay here. Like, that is literally how desperate I am. Like, do you want a GoFundMe? I'll start a GoFundMe. A GoFundMe was created to get Kylie Jenner to become the world's, fa- like, like youngest billionaire faster than what she was at. That's our society right now. I will start a GoFundMe to have JT Miller stay in Calgary. Like, don't go on the plane. I don't care. Like, I will literally force myself to be on the no-fly list if it means that he will stay here. I am literally so desperate for scoring that it is not even like I have run, I have restarted GM mode about eight million times, adding about eight different forwards. And I'm like, dude, like just Bradley, please. Like I, for the love of God, like oh my God, can you imagine this team with JT Miller? How sexy that would be! It would make our second line relevant, dude. It would be beautiful. Is tell me if you slot JT Miller in on that second line and the first line power play that we don't get a massive increase in point production. Not only that, but he's not a rental. Like you have him for next season as well, which would be huge. I don't care at this point who we bring in. Like I even posted this thing. It was of. Miller, Foley, Pavelski, Alex Debrinkit, dare I say his name again? Like, dude, like you take a look at Joe Pavelski. Everyone's like, oh, the guy's old. It's like, I don't give a shit. He's eight games above a point per game. Yeah, he's freaking deadly and he always has been. Like, can you like okay? Where where are you in with the whole acquiring a player with term? Well, given like, the, like given the off season that we're coming up with, you know what I that's mean? The, that's the thing is like, I don't want to, you know, as much as we need depth scoring right now and like need it for a playoff push this year, if it means that we have to lose Kachak or Gaudreau by bringing in a guy with term, that's scary. You know what I mean? And it, so, it's going to push. The- yeah. yeah. So then I'll ask you this. Would you be opposed to trading a first and a second or whatever the ask is for for a playoff run with Joe Pavelski down the middle? Yes. Because Joe Pavelski, imagine how fucking deadly this guy would be here under Daryl Sutter. He is an elite two-way center and he can finish. He's the one bright spot in Dallas this year. No one's talking about Tyler Sagan and Jamie Benn anymore. No one. No. No. Joe Pavelski's on the last year of his deal. He'd be a pure rental. If you can get Dallas to retain 50%. Beautiful. Or, right? Like, you, if, if you can get them to retain 50%, you'll be bringing him in at cheaper than what you'd be bringing into Foley. 
if you even if you give them like I don't know first like a first in Zari if that's their asking price, you do that. Like I'm like I'm in the camp where it's like I I don't care who we add add someone of caliber. Joe Pavelski might be the best player available. Joe Pavelski would be everything this team needs. He's a center, who's he's an elite center. I don't give a shit if he's 37, dude. He's not playing like he's 37. No, he's playing like he's freaking 27. And he would be an absolutely unreal addition. You're not adding on money heading into next year, right? If, if, if he comes in as a pure rental, fine. Thank you for the two months that you're a flame. Seriously. Honestly. Like, I don't – we need to add, and I feel like I would, I would be more comfortable – and this is why I think a lot of people say are saying like, could guys like Giroux or Pravelski, like could a trade or hurdle even like, could those trades even work out in terms of if you were to sell your assets to acquire them, are you acquiring them for just the rest of this season or are you going to re-sign them? And I'm like, you know what? There are certain players that if you acquired that would make your team better for this year, for a run this year, Fucking do it. And then yep. in the summer, when you start getting a sense of where all your chips fall in number-wise, yeah, then you can figure out how to tinker. If we acquire Pavelski, for example, and then he just doesn't resign, I like I don't, it doesn't matter to me. You no, had no, it yeah, I'm that or pissed off that he's not here next year. Like that's part of hockey. There's always buying and selling going on. And that's up to the general manager to address the team's needs when you come to that deadline day. And I just hope that Brad fucking actually does it for once. Like, let's say you can convince Philly or Dallas to retain half, right? I'm putting myself ourselves into the Jerusalem sweepstakes because why not? We know we're not going to get them anyway. So this is all hype. Yeah. yeah, screw it. If you retain half of Giroux's deal, right, you're absorbing 4.1 for the rest of this year, which is still cheaper than to fully at face value. Yeah. If you convince Dallas to retain 50, you'd be absorbing Pavelski for the rest of this year at 3.5. Yeah. Either one of those guys would be deadly for this team. Either one of them. I, like, I, I don't care. Just as long as you get someone of high caliber and not an AHL defenseman. If Brad comes in and acquires Pavelski as a pure rental, just being like, yeah, Pavelski's on our team now, A, I'll scream. Yeah. That's a disgusting ad. Like, I would literally, I might pass out. Like, I'm not kidding. Um, <laughs> that's an absolutely, like, that's a disgusting addition to bring a guy like Pavelski in. And I will cherish the absolute time that we have with him in a Flames jersey if he is yep. here, right? If you're going to go and bring in depth demon, I'm not opposed to you bringing in a depth defenseman if you address scoring first. Like, if you want to bring in Pavelski and then just out of nowhere, like, oh, yeah, we also tossed our seventh for this guy. I don't give a shit. Cool. Exactly. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I – Man, Joe Pavelski on this team would be disgusting, and no one can tell me otherwise. Holy I yeah, shit. he'd be a great fit. He'd be he'd play really well under the system for sure. And this is what I'm that is what I'm saying. Like you look at, do you want to be acquiring a guy with term? Like I get that J T. Miller to fully, dare I say, to brink it. Those guys are all cost controlled. Their their contracts aren't terrible at all for what they bring. Yeah. And you'd be having them on for an extra year heading into next year. But do you want to be taking the risk of adding in another five, five when you know, when you don't know for sure how in the hell you're going to be maneuvering Backlund's contract, Monahan's contract and Lucic's contract heading into next yep. year. <clears throat> yep. For sure. No, I, I agree with you on that. It's it, like the flames are in a pretty tough and sticky situation where it's got, it's like, you got to, tread lightly you know you gotta really take your time and really manage your cap hit and think about what these moves are gonna do to your cap in the future yeah honestly and but you know what you said and that really scares me and i like 
as much as I don't want to say it, I know it's the trade that's going to happen that the Flames are going to make. The Ben Chirot and our Terry Lekkinen package oh. coming. To- Once you said that, uh, I just kind of sat down and I just like, that is the most Brad for living trade I have heard yet this year. Like I thought of it and, you know, we're in on Lekkinen, we're in on Chirot. I was like, well, it looks like we're getting both. Like, welcome to Calgary, boys. Like, I'm this close to DMing both of them. Like, welcome. Literally. To like. Like, it, I just, I have that feeling, you know? Like, I, I, I've i known Brad for so long. I've known his tendencies. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I already know that, like, that is the trade that we're going to make. Next game's against Dallas. We're, no, we're going to get to see Pavelski in action. No. Dude, he's got, okay, so he's. He leads their whole team in, in scoring, 48 points in 41 games, 19 goals, 29 assists, and is a plus 14. Oh, On man. the Dallas Stars. That man. Go out okay. and get – And, he, yeah, he's playing on a pretty crappy hockey team, too. Yeah, like Dallas is not making the playoffs this year. <laughs> Dallas gets scored on more than they score, and he's a plus 14? Yeah. He's a plus 14 on a team with a minus six goal differential. Like I get being in on Miller. I get being in on Garland, but those are guys with term, unless you're absolutely terrified that, which I mean, we are, but at least you're, uh, unless you're absolutely certain, I think is the better word of that. Yeah. You're not going to be able to keep Goudreau, Kachuk and Mange, like the three of them, a contingency plan and acquiring a guy like JT Miller makes sense. But at the same time, like, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's it's scary. Man, if Pavelski was a flame, even if it's like he'll be a flame for three months, I'll like just oh god, well, dude, like I would literally buy a Pavelski jersey. I don't and care. the perfect ad for a playoff push. You know, he he's one of those locker room presences that has a lot of playoff experience as well. Like he he went on quite a few deep runs in San Jose. Yeah. Um, final. like it, it just it makes a lot of he's a right-handed shot like elite two-way guy it makes so much sense please and his cap is only 3.5 if well it's at seven but if you can convince dallas to retain oh, yeah, yeah. for letting go of a pure rental let's say blake coleman is on a line with manjapani and pavelski can you imagine how nasty that line two-way would be come playoff time? It'd be beautiful. Run Monaghan at the wing on the third line and have Backlund center with Dubé on the right. It just it makes so much sense. And because it makes so much sense, we know it's not happening. You know, it'd be an absolutely huge ad. It wouldn't constrain us heading into next summer. We'd understand that it's a pure rental, but at the same time, you got to have the balls to show that you give enough of a shit about trying to go all in. Exactly. And to me, let's say we acquire Pavelski, right? Let's say we lose in the first round again, as pissed off as I'd be, I'll be a little bit more content with it. in the fact that we actually tried to do something. Knowing that we actually tried to make a move to make this team better. No, definitely. I agree. That move makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. And like, and like screw term at this point, just get someone for this year because I'm awesome. so worried about what this summer is. I don't want more baggage on top of that. Yeah, exactly. 